Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more of the Great War. This time we're on a week 73. Despair and mutiny on the Italian front. So yay, we get to hear about more incompetence from Italian generals and Austro-Hungarian generals. The, they're so brilliant, these two armies here. They're, they're the best. I think, I think they could solo the entire world together. They're just... Their generals are just that good. Anyways, before we dive in, please make sure you check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. Okay, let's just go ahead and uh, dive right in. We've seen the Central Powers on top most of the year, taking enormous chunks of land on the Eastern Front, overrunning Serbia, beating back the Allies at Gallipoli, and holding their own on the Italian and Western Fronts. And this week... Woo, they've finally been beat, beating back Serbia, a country that probably should have fallen within the first year of this war had the Austro-Hungarians actually have a competent military structure, but they didn't, so, and they still don't. Oh, really, it was the Germans and Bulgarians that allowed Serbia to get defeated here. <laughs> Sees one more victory. This week, the Bulgarian army drives the British and French out of Macedonia. Woo. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. So what had just happened before? Well, in Mesopotamia, a British army was under siege at Kut with no relief anywhere in sight. The Bulgarians were fighting the British and French in Macedonia, and while the Allies were holding their own, they were way outnumbered. The Western and Eastern fronts were mostly quiet, and the call had finally been given for the Allies to admit defeat and evacuate Gallipoli. Here's what came next. I'd like to take a look first at the Italian front. Now, we don't realize it now, but after the fourth battle of the Isonzo River, the Italian army was near to collapse. The losses that Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna's forces had suffered were 400,000 casualties since May, and the survivors' morale was shaky at best. They had lacked weaponry, had been forced to charge en masse into machine gun defenses, had faced cholera and typhoid, they were poorly clothed, poorly fed, often slept in mud or on wet hay. They were, in short, cannon fodder. Communications were improvised. Most of the front line was exposed and vulnerable to counterattacks. Their trenches were often shallow scrapings in the ground, which were filthy and filled with garbage. The woolen uniforms they had would become almost parchment thin after facing the elements for months. They had shoes that were often cardboard uppers and wooden soles, which ruined their feet. They didn't have many helmets. They had wooden water bottles that were unhygienic. When they did have tents, they often leaked. The wire cutters for the enemy barbed wire were almost useless in general and totally useless under fire. They only had a hot meal in the morning, and from what I've read, it was often so bad that the men would refuse it, so malnutrition was common. Oh, oh it was that? It was so bad that they would rather starve than eat it. Dude, I have never been... I have certainly refused it, because, like, I know I'm lucky enough to live in a situation where if I choose not to eat one thing, I can eat a different thing. These motherfuckers are just choosing to starve entirely. What? On the heights, men tried not to freeze to death. They cooked their food on Primus stoves that made everything taste of gasoline. They Yummy. They slept in pits, packed together for warmth. And when the men cuddle up, boys, cuddle up, get that warmth. Men had time away from the front lines. They were usually drafted into labor battalions. There was no organized recreation of any kind since Cadorna did not believe in soldiers having free time. So, so <laughs> an amazing soldiers general. were banned from entering cafes or pubs during the day and could not, in many cases, mingle with civilians. Soldiers were even arrested for walking arm in arm with their fiancés. No movie theaters, no libraries. In fact, the only real distractions the men had were alcohol and authorized brothels, separate for officers and enlisted men, of course. Oh, of course, of course. Cadorna encouraged, no, Cadorna demanded callousness on the part of his senior officers, which didn't do morale any good. One corps commander, General Vincenzo Garrioni, said that the massacre of infantry was a necessary holocaust and was therapeutic and would strengthen the army for future battles. Yes, that is insane. And I'm 
so hold on. Someone explain to me how a peninsula, all right, Italy, uh, could be home to so many historically amazing generals. But now they're like this. Really let yourself go, Italy. You really let yourself go. Ugh. And even after more than half a year of war, thousands of lives were lost because a lot of the men lacked basic training and hadn't even been told to keep their heads down when they first reached the trenches. They hadn't been told how to lay wire or how to throw hand grenades, and the sanitation was grotesque. It is not surprising that discipline failed, and the first proper mutiny in the Italian forces happened this week. The 48th Regiment had been reduced to 700 men from 3,000 after mm. four months in the trenches. On December 11th, 200 of the men were given leave, but the other 500 were sent back to the front line. This didn't sit well with the men, and shots were fired. A court-martial was set up, and two soldiers were executed. A few days later, in Camno on the middle Isonzo, a regiment was ordered back to the front lines, and someone fired a shot at the officer's mess. The divisional command surrounded the regiment with four battalions and even brought in machine guns and artillery. At a court-martial the next day, eight men were sentenced to death and many more to 20 years hard labor. The rest of the regiment were forced to watch the executions and were then escorted to the front line by military police. You can imagine what morale was like by now on the whole Italian front. Yeah, let's send the men that just mutinied to the front lines. They'll do great. They'll... Another front where morale was low and had been for months was at Gallipoli. The decision had been made to finally evacuate, though, and plans were made for the evacuation to take place the 19th. But how would that be possible? The Allies had something like 83,000 men, 186 big guns, loads and loads of stores and animals. They would have to take all that off in small boats on a beach that was totally under enemy fire. And what if the snows and stormy weather of early December returned? Well, Brigadier General Brudenell White had a cunning plan, and it was just about to be put into action. Now, the Allies were actively retreating on another southern theater of war this week in Macedonia. By December 11th, British and French forces that had been facing the Bulgarians along the Vardar River were getting close to the Greek border. That day, the Bulgarians unleashed a final attack, taking 8,000 casualties. The following day, the Allies crossed into Greece, and the Bulgarians made no move to follow them, perhaps not wishing to draw Greece into the war. And something that Fair enough, fair enough. It was fortunate for the Allies crossing the border on the 12th. It was only on the 11th that Greece had agreed to allow Allied forces freedom of movement. Oh. French General Maurice Sarrel should get a lot of cred for the way the retreat was handled. The terrain was tough, there were no roads, and only a single track of railway. But they managed to move all of their guns and supplies with them and only took 3,500 total casualties. They dug in. Yeah, he's doing, he's, he's doing a pretty competent job there. A few kilometers south of the Greek border, on a line about 25 kilometers long. The French on the left, and the British on the right. The British flank being about 50 kilometers from Salonika. The Bulgarians published the following on the 14th. December 12th, 1915 will remain for the Bulgarian army and nation a day of great historical importance. The army on that day occupied the last three Macedonian towns that still remained in the hands of the enemy. The last fights against the British, French, and Serbians took place near Dwoiran and Okrida Lakes. The enemy was beaten everywhere. Macedonia is free. Not a single enemy soldier remains on Macedonian soil. Woo! It went on to say that it took 40 days to beat Serbia, but only 10 to beat the British and French, and that Bulgaria had taught these so-called great powers of Britain and France a real lesson about hmm. fighting. There are Good job, Bulgaria. Good job. There are now over 80,000 Bulgarian troops between Monastir and the Greek border. And here are a few notes to round out the week. On the 11th, Russians take the Bulak Pass and occupy Hamadan in Persia. They routed German-paid rebels, over 20,000 strong, equipped with rifles and machine guns. On the 13th, British under Colonel Gordon defeat 1,200 Senussites at Wadi Shaifa in North Africa. And on the 14th, General Horace Smith Dorian was given command in East Africa. Now, he had fought well on the Western Front, notably at Mons and Lakato back at the beginning of the war, but had been relieved of his command during the Second Battle of Ypres. 
for requesting permission from Commander John French to retreat from the Eve salient to a better defensive position. He and French had clashed for years, and that was the final straw. Smith Dorian would contact pneumonia on the way to Africa and would never serve there, returning to England in January 1916. And the week ends with despair and mutiny on the Italian front, a retreat into Greece and plans for another at Gallipoli, as the East and West remain mostly quiet. We see so much death every week that sometimes we, well, I, forget to think of the despair of those who remained alive, those Italians who had had it with marching straight into Austrian machine guns, the Serbian population freezing in the Albanian mountains as their country is overrun, knowing that the Allied help had failed. The men from the corners of the world sitting on the now freezing beaches of Gallipoli, wondering what would become of them. And next week, it's Christmas. This Woo. was supposed to be the war that would be over by Christmas, remember? And it would be over by Christmas but certainly not Christmas 1915. Or 1916. Actually, at the beginning... Or 1917. But 1918... ...of the war, the soldiers really were told it would be over by Christmas 1914. As we know, obviously, that was not the case. No, you it wasn't. Click right and that was despair and mutiny on the Italian front. The Great War, week 73. This was more, uh... This was one of the slower weeks, um, where not much is happening. Um... They're probably setting things up on the western and eastern front for big movements, right? We're probably not going to see anything for maybe a while on those fronts because it being winter now. But we'll see what week 74 has in store for us. Hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.